perhaps one of the more interesting things I've seen after, this is my 50th year, and uh, one of the more interesting things I've seen is uh, how we repeat the same mistakes uh, over and over and over, and um, how many of the problems that we are attributing to technology are really people problems. And I think that's something we really need to work through, and I don't know how to do that. It's, it's very hard to teach people what's a technology problem and what's a people problem, and I think uh, more often than technology is a people issue. Um, the first slide is the uh, usual uh, disclaimers. I have nothing to disclose. I don't own any of these companies. Um, I don't have any investments in any of these companies, and I'm not getting any money from any of these companies I'm going to talk about today, so uh, that's a nice thing to say. Um, I'm basically going to try to get you to understand what the government influence of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is, and to, that many of the things, the activities we're taking on right now really are entirely driven by uh, either the circumstances of the marketplace or what's happening in Washington, the other Washington. Um, I want to speak on behalf of the, the economic lecture that we had last week. I felt really obligated to show the next three slides. And I want to show you the slide from, this is hematology in, in back in 1970. That's a picture that came out of the MedTech brochure. And if you look here, we have a lot of test tubes, we have beakers, we have, we have a person actually doing testing. Uh, now move on. What's the herb, Dave? <laughs> the herb. The herb in the, the leaves. I have no idea. <laughs> And if you look at the technology today, the laboratory looks like this. And um, this is in 2012, which is about a year after we put up our automation line. But you can see the remarkable difference. We've replaced almost everything uh, from the test tube, the bench, the people. A lot of them have been supplanted by technology. And this is the same type of thinking I think people are trying to look and say, how do we make uh, medicine more like the technology? Uh, and I don't know, we can and we can't. I think this is the premise that I think we're working on right now. I think the assumptions have out there have been driven by the current policies out there. And I might add that this is one of the more interesting times because it's very few times you go around spending your time reading the Federal Register instead of reading their, the journals. And I can tell you Federal Register readings are not very interesting. Um, in the next slide, this is probably the most important slide you'll see today in terms of medical economics. If you look here, the CBC in 1987, which is when the, 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 the fees schedules got started, for a straight CBC without a differential, it was $8.91. With a differential, it was $9.57. As of today, we are now getting $8.89. So over the last 10 years, or 14, 15 years, we've lost two cents in real dollars, in, in dollars, and if you do the CPI correction, the real dollars, the $10 in 1989 is worth $19.18 today, according to a CPI calculator that was in, on, on the web. And which, you know, for all practical purposes, we're saying we're getting $4.50 for that $9 test. And remember last week, we were told how the lab was very cost ineffective. I would challenge anybody else in healthcare today to do something like this, to show this kind of economics. And I don't think you can. And, uh, and I think the issue is, when you start looking at healthcare economics, the laboratory's probably, and I'm proud to say, the best out there. Now, if you want to go move on, this is what healthcare is looking like in the rest of the industry. You saw some of this. We, we are spending from 3.6 this is trillion dollars. To 2014, we're expected to spend 3.8 trillion, and we're going to 4 trillion in 2015. And what do we get for that money? Well, we get the highest healthcare spending in the, in the world per capita. Okay? We exceed the nearest person in healthcare spending by a significant amount. In fact, if you look, it's almost double that of, of the nearest person down below. I think it's Canada is number two, and it's barely there. So, and what, what, what else do we get in return for this? Well, let's see. Our life expectancy is probably what? 
falls behind everyone and we're near Chile in the Czech Republic. That's not a very good deal. We're not getting a very good bargain. Not only are we paying twice as much, we're getting half as much. So if you keep on going, what have we done? We've got a lot of people in, in Washington who says this can't go on forever. And so we have a $700 billion stimulus bill that was designed to facilitate the economics during a severe recession that came in 2009. What slipped in as part of that stimulus bill? A little thing called high tech, which was 27 billion in incentives for the use of electronic health record. Now, I don't think most people thought much of that bill in, in that, and, and actually the overall uh, money associated with electronic health records is actually around 35 or 37 billion dollars. Two billion went into the Office of the National Coordinator and some other sundry fundings for, the, uh, uh, for quality measures and things like that. Um, what made it really a force was the companion bill that came called the Patient Affordable Care Act that came in 2010. And inside the 2010 Act, of course, which was the one that we call Obamacare, which extended health care coverage, were some quality measures and practice guidelines that became part of the measures that are needed for enforcing, uh, in a, in a, essentially the, the EHR became the, the enforcement tool for these measures. If you look, what has the ACA done? It's done a really good job of covering people, but it still leaves a lot of people uninsured. It, it, by 2022, it's expected to cover approximately half of the uninsured. So we went from approximately 40, 40 million uninsured to about 20 million uninsured. Hey David, if all the states had done their Medicaid expansion, what would it be? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, these are broad numbers, obviously. These are projected numbers. I don't know these projected numbers actually uh, consider the unexpanded um, consequences, but I think the unexpanded does cause a tr significant problem. But let's look at this chart. We're going to expand coverage, okay, and in 2011, we're going to start decreasing the total cost of health care in the United States. Does this make sense? I don't know. I, I think the assumptions that have been made to, to cause this decrease is based on the fact is that the uninsured are going to get covered and so on, are going to be paid for in a, in a more organized way. To balance this, we have something called the Triple Aim, which is Berwick's paper that came in approximately 2008. And Berwick, as you know, became the acting commissioner of HHS, um, was appointed as a, as a recess appointment, and he subsequently got basically booted out by the Republican Congress. But the basic theme that came in in the Triple, triple uh, uh, Aim was to improve individual experience of health care, um, to improve the health care population as a whole, and to reduce the cost. So we have something here which is kind of interesting economics, which is we're going to improve everything and then we're going to decrease the cost. And if you look at that, this Berwick's model was translated into CMS. And this came, these are slides straight out of CMS's websites. And you can see the triple claims, triple aim in goal one, goal two, and goal, th goal three. And essentially all these three aims are reflected. Now, if you look at the triple aim, how is it being enforced? It's being enforced through the e-care, or e-health, as they call it. So all these measurements that you hear about, health information exchange, that's part of an EHR. Uh, ACA rules and how do you, the Affordable Care Act, ACA, is also being enforced, essentially, through an electronic medical record. E-quality measures, how do you do e-quality without electronic medical record? SNOMED coatings, um, CCDA, the electronic dis you know, transmission of data between, pati between patients and facilities, IC10. It turns out LOINC coding, which all the people in lab know about, right? You use it every day. <laughs> you don't? Gee, I'm surprised. Um, and, and then you have the EHR initiative programs. And uh, all these, again, 5010 is, of course, part of IC10. But these measures are all tied in and, and have been long-term goals of, of CMS. And again, this is a CMS slide. I'm stealing all this from the CMS website. 
When you look at C CMS's meaningful use, meaningful use is, is the part of the bill that says, I'm going to use the electronic medical record, and the, the way I'm going to judge whether you've used the electronic medical record properly is a program called meaningful use. Uh, we have other terms to apply to that, but basically, again, you see the triple aim being men mentioned, improve the quality, safety, efficacy, and, and reduce disparities, engage patients and family, improve care coordination, maintain privacy, and MU co compliance, by getting the electronic medical record out there, you're gonna have better, better clinical outcomes, uh, improve population health. You know, this sounds like Camelot. And it's gonna be done in five years, okay? Everything started in 2009, in two years, I'm going to have stage one, which is I'm going to get all those systems installed. In year, two years after that, I'm going to get them all working correctly. And two years after that, everything's going to be perfect and we're going to have all the ideal outcomes. Does this, this sound reasonable? And it, and it was called stage one, stage two, and stage three. Approximately, as of July 31st, approximately 25 billion out of the 27 billion dollars have been given out in incentives. And essentially, this program uh, starts in 2009. And for, there's two, there's really four programs in place. You, you get, uh, you have a program for Medicare, you have Medicaid, and you have a program for hospitals, and you have uh, a program for providers. And so, when you looked at the, the, the there's something, the euphemism called revenue adjustments come in in 2015 if you don't participate or you under participate. Of course, the revenue adjustments are not positive, so I just want to point that out. Um, the eligible provider is a maximum is of 44,000. That's if you start in the first year and you go on. And it's a front loaded program. So the first year you get 18,000, the fifth year you get 2,000. That's if you fully participate. Uh, in 2015, you start getting revenue adjustments. The revenue adjustments is 1% the first year, 2% the second year, approximately 3% the third year, and can go as high as 5%. Um, if you look at the, all the other programs that CMS is tied to this, you'll see that that number seemingly is small, but it's not when you start looking at the real dollars. Now, stage one was started in 2011. And that was two years after the program was started. They took, they, they, the people scrambled to get the specifications out, and they got them out in 20, late 2010. So vendors really had very little time to respond, let alone new users. Um, what you have is you have a program that had 50, something like 25 measures. On the surface, these 25 measures looked very innocent except when you start drilling down the details, they became much more difficult because of the detailed list. But essentially 15 measures are required and 10 measures belong in what is known as the menu side. In the menu side, the, a user had or a hospital had to pick five of the 10 menu items. And many of the menu items look straightforward again, but they get more and more complicated. The problem was in 2014, the standards changed totally. And so the measures were the same, but the details were different. So Basically, if you were meeting the measure in 2012, in 2014, you may have to go back and redo all your measures. The other thing about these, this program is it's an all or none. You, you, you either make the program or you don't make it. So it's not like you can almost make the program, you don't get 50% credits for meeting things halfway. And so the dollar impact can be quite large when you start doing the aggregate event. For example, the incentives we received I think this year alone from the program were $15 million. And the penalties will probably be twice that if we didn't meet it starting next year. Now stage two started in 2014 for all people. And the amazing thing is, and I'll go and show some de data about this later, stage one, almost 85 or 90% of the people participated. In stage two, the number of successful participation has fallen way, way down to something almost uh, appalling, which means that this, the, the, the seemingly small steps between stage one and stage two probably are quite large. 
Now the basic requirements for EHRs, and these are all part of the core measures, is you have to get the problem list, you have to get people to generate a problem list, you have to have a medication list, and you have to do a medication reconciliation, you have to do a history and physical exam, you have to have an immunization record, you have to have labs, radiology, and, and other data, you have to have CPOE, uh, you have to have e-prescribe, and you have to have a series of, meet a series of clinical quality measures called CQM. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with clinical quality measures, essentially they all reference the uh, NQF standards, but they measure, then, so you have a number of derivatives of the NQF uh, measures which come out to PQRS, CQM, but they're all a little bit different in the way they measure it and count the details. So that it may be, say, you have to do A1C for diabetics, but how you count the diabetics and how you count the numerators and denominators of meeting seem to be a little different. So the vendors, and both us and the vendors, have a lot of trouble in trying to get the programs to work correctly. The other things that come out of the EHR uh, requirements are uh, things that, that to improve patient care. Um, you have to engage the patient. By engaging a patient, you have something known as an after-visit summary. So when you leave, the doctors are supposed to give you a little summary of what you had your visit, which essentially is all the meds you're on, the problem list, and, and any instructions, special instructions. Um, I can tell you this has been a very positive thing for uh, me when I deal with my 95-year-old mother, because I can tell you between her heart of hearing and her memory, it's very impossible to figure out what's there, so I use that to guide me taking care of it. So from a family and from a practice standpoint, it's very, very nice to have. This is also one of those things that is probably one of the most difficult measures for uh, clinicians to, to satisfy, and Tom here probably can do a better job of explaining why, but I think it has a lot to do with the fact is that workflow is not entirely conducive. It means that the patient, the doctor has to complete all the work while the patient's right there, and they can't finish the notes and everything later that evening, which is, of course, the practice a lot of people do. Now, from the standpoint of coordinating care, there's a whole set of rules here for uh, transition of care documentation, for discharge summaries and referrals. And from a public health standpoint, there's something known as syndromic surveillance, immunization requirements. And we have a few people here who are involved in trying to get the state DOH reporting system going, um, which we, and, and some measures we had from the lab that came up, you know, 12 hours before we were due. We're, we, we did well. Um, one of the things that's very interesting, I found very interesting, is this advisory board, which is a think tank, gave a summary of what they felt were very, very difficult things to, be, to, to meet for, for the, the measures that were on the meaningful use list. And the things that they circled around were the three measures up here were something known as the transition of care, and I'll go through that a little bit later. The view, download, and transmit. These were all electronic measures that the patient and the, and the quality measures that the system would have to do that judge that was dealing with transfer of information between systems and the patient care quality measures. Now, if you look, the stage one measures are down here. So what they effectively said is that there's a huge gap between the stage one measures, and these are the three stage two measures that, came, that come out. And this was predicted by this group, I think, almost three or four years before the current state. The consumer engagement, just want to show you what's happened. How many of you have signed up for the patient portal? So a fair number of you. That's good. Do you like it? Do most of you like it? Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that's been driven by, essentially, a requirement of the uh, meaningful use uh, criteria. And, and, and it was in many of the systems prior to that, but it's certainly getting them out and getting it uh, widely used has not been a, a common practice. And certainly in the primary care areas, they've used uh, the patient portals. But now virtually everybody has a patient portal. And you can see two of the patient portals we have. We have one for the uh, EPIC, and we have one for Cerner, the ORCA. We also have, this is a little slow here, uh, we have the uh, uh, a commercialization of healthcare. And these have been met with very, very uh, these are commercial companies like Microsoft and Google, and now Apple has entered. So we have the, 
patient individual records that you can go through in, in, in with the individual EHR, and there's these health records that um, companies have set up and uh, expect people to take their health records and download them from the patient portal so they can have a record that they keep for themselves and they can transfer to other people as they move around. It turns out these things have had variable degrees of success. Google dropped using their, their patient portal largely because it was not being used. Microsoft still is keeping their patient portal going, but I, I don't know how much activity is going on there. But it's very interesting that Apple and IBM just announced for the iOS 8 release that they're now supporting uh, a, a, a self-managed patient portal. And I, I don't know, I haven't seen anything of it, and so this announcement is not clear of where it's gonna go, but this is not, this is a, a, another thing that's, that's kind of been encouraged by, the, again, the, the, uh, the, the Washington think tank, but has been variably successful in the marketplace. You might have also seen that the status and the performance of providers are now being put onto websites. And this is one from Consumer Reports that came out in July 2012. And by, by and large, um, one of the things that might be notable is the academic hospitals don't do very well. They typically score about ha halfway down in these, in these, and a lot of these have to do with patient, patient perception and patient care. Now, to coordinate care, the number of tools have been put out there. One is known as a, a, a EHR information interchange. And in that, you have essentially uh, two models. You have a, a, essentially a hub. And this is the original model that was prepared. So in, 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 in Indianapolis, there was a regional hub set up uh, that, that serviced all the hospitals in Indianapolis. And patients could go into that hub and get retrieve their data from all the facilities that were taking care of them. This model has been uh, successful in about three or four parts of the country, three or four cities in the country. For the most part, people have set up hubs and they have failed because there was no financial support. Again, either patients didn't want to pay for it, which they usually don't, and, or providers won't, don't, don't want to pay for it. Again, the incentives aren't there. Um, the states and where they have been successful, including Wisconsin, ironically, Texas, and, and in uh, uh, Indianapolis, largely have been states where the state itself uh, did some of the funding of the support. But in this model, essentially what you do is everybody sends their data to a central hub. And that central hub is then sent to a community provider or to a patient. The model that has come in uh, more recently is something uh, called a point-to-point -point exchange. And this model was, uh, again, introduced, um, uh, well, actually it was around a lot longer. The VA system used this model. So if, if you had a VA patient that was in Tampa, Florida, and someone from Washington needed to pull their record, they could just query the system in, in Tampa and pull the results back. And um, this, in, in the Epic system, this, uh, this, this software is known as Care Everywhere. Um, and uh, the equivalent really isn't there for the other systems. And uh, the, the ability of this thing, the point-to-point -point interchange to work between vendors has been somewhat problematic. Now, UW uh, has a number of, we tried to build our own information interchange because we have this Cerner Epic problem, and we tried to use the tools that were there. And it's been interesting. The, we've had some success in doing it technically, but we couldn't sustain it, and its value has not been entirely clear because the amount of data that's been transferred has been very limited to the problem list and the medication list and also to, to things like um, you, know, you know summaries. You don't have the deep dive stuff that oftentimes people want. And this, this, it, someone calls this PAML problems, allergies, medications, lab, and immunizations. The Care Everywhere model is a little different because Actually, the EPICs have been able to transfer pretty much the entire medical record. And we brought up Care Everywhere approximately a year ago. And you can see that in the time that we started this, uh, with relatively little encouragement, um, the users have gone up to something like 8,000 transactions a month. 
just inbound and, and something like 6,000 outbound. So, you know, the transaction rate of interchanging records between providers, for example, you can go and query Cleveland Clinic because they have an EPIC system. We can query UCSF because they have an EPIC system. If you know that patient's there, it'll look up that patient for you and it'll pull the record for that patient into, into our record and you can view it. So it's like essentially a, a medical transfer of information. The transition of care is a more formalized method and general method for doing this. And basically the model came up that if I transfer a patient into service, I have to have a transition of care document. So if I refer a patient to you, you get a transition of care document. When that patient is discharged, I send back a transition of care document. This is probably one of the most difficult uh, uh, standards that they've created, in part because and, uh, it brings back to what Noah was saying that I was in there when email first came out. The, this is an email, they base it on a private email protocol, but this private email protocol looks exactly like the email protocol I used in 1980. It's not, it, it, they've not got the sophistication needed to really make it work. And actually, I think basically uh, the standard came out in very, very rapidly, and I think many of the people down in Washington know what's wrong with the standard, but there hasn't been enough time to resolve it. So in, the, in all the stage two measures we have, the one that we aren't, as UW, has been having trouble meeting has been the transition of care process. Now, transition of care is really evolving, and the, probably the, the most difficult transition of care issue is the email address. There's no way that you can get an email address from anything other than someone telling you what that email address is. There's no central directory. Uh, anywhere. So no one's going to know my email address unless someone posts on a website or actually at, calls up and gets it. So it's sort of like a fax number problem. Uh, the problem is when you have electronic systems out there, it's very difficult to, to retrieve that information and transfer it and build it into the other system. Now another thing that came out of the Meaningful Use Standard is that we're now going to measure providers and how well they're doing. And we're going to get reward them when they do well. That's the CQM process. And we're going to punish them if they don't do well. And we're also going to create organizations called accountable care organizations, an ACO, in which the whole organization now takes responsibility for the outcome of the patient. Now, when you look at this, this came from uh, our Jeannie Lowe, uh, who's one of our uh, QA people in the UW Medicine. These are the measures that have been created by CMS to judge you on how well you're doing. There's a few there you might be looking at. That's a, this isn't a slide that's important. Look at the next slide. The revenue adjustments. If you collectively look at all the revenue adjustments that can come out for providers, and that includes the meaningful use stuff I talked about earlier, it can add up to as much as 9%. That's on the provider side. On the hospital side, if you don't do your job properly, the number is close to 19%. So you have a, a, a potentially somewhere between 10 and 20% of your budget could be at risk if you don't do a good job of meeting these quality measures or you don't participate in them. Now, I don't know how many of you looked this up. Just this week, I think they, they, they put up all the measures they've been collecting, and they're posting on the website. And I looked up Harview. You can look up Harview. You can look up you. You can look up Children's. They're all on here. And basically, you'll see the measures says significantly better than uh, the average, significantly worse than the average, or average. And so some of the outcomes, some of the measures, we actually show very, we, we actually do significantly worse than average. And you can look through those measures. But the measures they measure include um, readmissions, complications, you know, the measures that we've all talked about. Accountable care, of course, is the latest. And this is, a, of course, uh, there's a federal definition of accountable care, 
and there's been an, a, a Commonwealth Care that's been driven by, in this area, by the Boeing affiliation. And basically, it says basically if, if an institution is taking care of patients and they have outcomes that are bad compared to a national norm, that they will absorb the cost of that. If they, if they do better than the national average or in some measure that's been put out there, then they will share in the, in the savings. Now, Boeing obviously has some significant incentives to reduce their health care costs. So again, when you start looking at it, this is another way of driving down health care costs, which of course is a consideration that elderly people have. Now, CMS's definition of accountable care organizations can be stated here, but the, essentially what Boeing has and what CMS has are, and you can participate, in fact, there's a, there's a beacon program which uh, is part of the uh, meaningful use uh, of the AC, the ARRA Recovery Act that you could have subscribed to and participate. And there's a whole group in the eastern side of the mountains that did create, create a beacon pro project that essentially was an accountable care organization, which uh, they subscribed to CMS, so, uh, uh, Medicare providers have subscribed to. What's the observation of meaningful use? Well, I think the number one thing, I just want to comment on my insight on the technical side on this. Um, the Probably the most difficult thing out there today from a technology standpoint in developing software, remember these are all software based projects, is that the specifications that are coming out are incomplete. They're often developed without any basis of, uh, of the thought of, of what it would take to develop the software. Uh, things like the in uh, changing, interchanging data between electronic health systems is a totally new area. The good news is it's, it's kind of working. The bad news is it's kind of working. The other thing is that these systems, and may, many of you may or may not know, these systems are all 20, 25 years old. In order, Epic started in 1988. Uh, the Cerner system actually started earlier, but it was a major revision in 1995. So when you talk about it, they're all in the 20 plus years range. Um, well, the other thing is about software development is the, the size of the code. Um, Epic has said to have anywhere between 30 and 35 million lines of code. And um, Cerner is said to have 40 million lines of code. To give you a reference range, um, Microsoft Windows has approximately 50 million lines of code. Um, Microsoft seems to be able to generate 50 million lines of code every five years or so. Um, most of the vendors out there have trouble developing 50 million lines of code except over 20 years. And, and many of the things that are being asked for in the software things are significantly different than what the underlying structure was envisioned 20, 20, 25, 30 years ago. To give you a rough idea of what it takes, an average programmer can generate under, now this is a very broadly speaking uh, term, but can generate 3,000 lines of code a year. Now you have 50 million lines of code. How many programmers do you need to do 3,000 uh, 3, lines of code a year? You're gonna have to have an army of programmers. And many of the companies that are out there do not have this army of programmers. And you'll see a little bit what that means. This is the uh, market survey that came out of class, which is a, uh, a, a kind of a survey group that's like Consumer Reports and they just report on the companies. If you look, the, there are three companies and this is a neutral plate. These are people who have lost and these are people who have the sales that they have gained. If you look at the top three companies, there's a huge separation because from this point down, the companies all lost more customers than they gained. And from this point up, they gain customers or they're neutral. It turns out the top three companies, and this may or may not be obvious, are all companies that have large software development shops. And the three companies there are Epic, Cerner, and Meditech. Almost all the other companies out here are either too small or don't have sufficient, or have used a model where they, they buy software companies and they don't actually develop their own software. And so these companies have been caught under the meaningful use criteria because they've been forced to to put functions that have never been in the systems before. 
So the original purpose of meaningful use was to broaden the customer base, broaden the vendor offerings. The net outcome that's come out in the last year or so is a tremendous consolidation of the marketplace. Now we've been really fortunate to have two of the companies that are in this list. We're also fortunate or unfortunate to have one of the companies that's on the bottom half of this list. And uh, you may know that Siemens was recently sold to Cerner, uh, or will be sold to Cerner, because Siemens has decided they can't keep up with the marketplace. And Cerner, of course, is one. Cerner and Epic are both among the top development shops. To see that this, this issue comes in the United States, is the, the experience we've had in the United States is not unique. Uh, there's two efforts that are well known out there of other countries that have tried to create a national EHR effort. Uh, the two most famous ones out there are probably the, the, the British and the, and the, and the Dutch. Uh, and I think both of these are very interesting because the things that came out of both these programs off, have a lot of similarity to where we are today. The UK uh, program, and I think Tom here may know more about the, the details, was $11.4 billion billion pound project. Uh, and it went from 2002 to 2011, and essentially it was sunsetted by UK. Uh, the Dutch also had a, another effort um, where they spent uh, something like 300 million euros, or 400 million dollars, and they ended that project in 2011, approximately after nine years of effort. Now there are other countries out there who have tried the effort, but they're much smaller, and the efforts are probably less clear to me from a standpoint of information. Um, this is the report from the UK, from the, from the uh, uh, Public Accounts Committee, which essentially is like the GAO. What's interesting on this um, list are the things, reasons why the project failed. And the two or three more reasons are, are, are kind of interesting. I mean, more obvious ones are weak manage, management oversight and usual things. But the, the, the main thing that comes out strikingly was that vendors failed to show benefits that were promised. And the second thing that came out um, is, the, uh, is the security of these systems. And the last thing that came out was inability to control future expense or know what the future expense of these systems are. Now that's the British report. Now here's the, um, the Dutch report that, by the way, uh, this was translated through Google Translate, so you have to take liberties here. I, I got the Dutch article from someone and the, I had to run it through Google Translate. But again, um, the, the, the things here is, is it didn't work as a national database. The goals have not been demonstrated. Again, this has, sounds very similar to the British one. They couldn't do data exchange. And get, look what's here's, what couldn't be exchanged. They said medications um, and physician observations were interchanged, but lab data was having trouble and the system was insecure. So the security issue keeps coming up over and over. Um, what's very interesting is, if you look, what is the major difference between where we are today and what the Dutch and the British have? They have a national health care system. They don't, they don't do billing as part of their uh, business model. And they have a national patient identifier. All the things that we don't have that adds overhead in, our, in being able to do this. Again, expense came up. Now, what's interesting too is that the Dutch have abandoned their own local efforts, and they've uh, three Epic systems have been installed in the Netherlands in the last year, two years, and so they may be marching toward a, a, a commercial model that's very similar to the United States. Now, what are the major challenges with ma meaningful use? Well, one of the things that we talked about was the timelines are just too short. They gave a two-year timeline. In that two-year timeline, you're supposed to create the specifications, you're supposed to be and get the vendors to write the software, and then, they, then the users are supposed to implement all the changes they need to implement. Uh, in reality, three years is a very short timeline for any, any company that's doing but the, the type of changes that people are introducing in the system are enormous. So it makes the three-year timeline extremely challenging. This is probably one of the number one criticisms that came out. The other thing is that not only are these timelines short, but the specifications for these, many of these functions are incomplete or still pending. And something that's aside is that the politics of things have been that there have been all kinds of competing mandates uh, that CMS has introduced all in an attempt to try to reduce costs. 
Um, I think I showed you some, some data about uh, how many providers I mentioned in stage two. In stage one, if you look over here, we have something like 215 or uh, 268,000 providers attested to stage one, meaningful use. As of mid-year, seven months in, 800 providers have attested successfully. Is there a gap here? By the way, in terms of hospitals, six hospitals have attested. And over here, we have something like 4,000 hospitals attested. So we've successfully tested for stage one, and we're starting to test for stage two, but we're seeing the same difficulties in measuring and meeting stage two. So this has actually caught notice of the people in Washington. The fact is the numbers are so low is almost striking. Now, we're probably going to see some increase, but it probably will be nowhere near the numbers we're talking about. Now, privacy and security came up, remember, under the British thing? Well, we're going to have the same issue here, too. And we have the regulations that have been introduced, and one of the measures that came up under meaningful use is you have to have a secure system. Well, essentially, OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, is going around um, enforcing the HIPAA security rules. Guess how OCR pays for themselves? They pay for themselves through the fines they're levied. And so they, they have a lot of incentives to, to actually find something wrong with you. Uh, Columbia University, if you remember, lost something like $4.3 million because someone left some medical records on the subway. So this doesn't have to be electronic. This can be uh, physical. Um, there are all kinds of regulations that have come through which are incredibly difficult. NIST 800, the National Institute of Standard, is responsible for creating the standards that are used under meaningful use. And the NIST 800 security standard is part of the privacy rules. Now, why is this important? Well, if you look at this, Reuters made a comment that um, your medical record's worth more than your credit card. Why? Medicare fraud. Basically, once they have your number, they can bill Medicare for services, and they can make money out of doing that. So you don't have to be a, suffering from this, but the Medicare ends up paying for it, or we all pay for it. Um, the other thing is, uh, there, may, many of you may know about the pres prescription um, monitoring program that is placed, I think our people in toxicology know this. There's a statewide prescription monitoring program essentially that says I'm keeping records of all the people who are using narcotics. And this, I think it's something like in 32 out of the 48 states right now such a program is placed. Essentially these are being hooked into the electronic health record uh, with encouragement from ONC. The Office of National Coordinator. And so uh, the issue is a, the ACLU recently has a lawsuit out there saying, does law enforcement have a right to look in that database? And I think that this, this issue is still unsettled, but is that a privacy issue or not? The laboratory, by the way, in case you, you, you might know, we've been, people here who have worked in the laboratory know that in the last couple of months they've been tied up most of these projects are totally invisible to you, but they're, they're causing a lot of work. And they include changing the interfaces to deliver loin codes. And uh, loin codes are being used to report to Department of Health uh, for reportable diseases. Um, they're also being used to report to syndromic surveillance. They're also being used for the transition of care documentation. And so um, these have caused major work in terms of the internal structure, revisions and upgrades in our lab system. And most of these benefits are probably going to be outside the lab and not inside the lab. AMA issued a report, and you, you're welcome to read it, um, that came up October 2014, which is a couple of weeks ago. Um, essentially, the interesting thing about the AMA report is that it doesn't say anything really um, outstanding, out, you know, very, very unreal. It's a very realistic report. But one of the things that they had was that they want more time, and they want people to have the ability to make exemptions or to improve quality reporting. 
So uh, I bring this up, the community is generally in agreement with, with the changes that are needed in the program. And so the good news is that with all these agreements and everything, that there is a recognition among, uh, in Washington that the changes need to be done. Now whether there's a willpower politically to make these changes and to make the corrections in the program, uh, it's still a grand experiment. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the, there are some outcomes that have really been very clear. Number one is there's a, a tremendous increase in the uh, use of electronic health record. I think the question of whether this is going to result in better health outcomes is still unclear. The other thing that's came out in the last month or so is that this two-year plan to create, to get systems to talk to each other has morphed. So five years have elapsed from the original plan, which is 2009, and now in June of 2014, it's now become a 10-year plan from 2014. So we've made the interoperability plan that was originally five or three or four years into a 15-year plan, which actually probably is a reasonable goal. And so in spite of the political uh, verbiage that's going out there, there's some really deep thought thinking processes that actually has identified what it takes to get this to happen. And you can see that they, they've drawn very complicated diagrams of how to get there. So this, this three-stage, five-year program has now become a four-stage, 10-year program. Uh, and whether or not it's going to happen is, is still unclear. And so uh, it can, you can read the, what the summaries are, but basically I think we're starting to see significant changes in the EHRs. We're seeing a tremendous drive. There's a tremendous amount of resources being put into this right now, a lot of dollars being put into this. Um, and the, a lot of the efforts, the reason why things aren't being done for you from a computer standpoint might very well be all the efforts that are going on to get the electronic health record going. Thank you. Oh, I like this one. This is uh, the future. You have the Camel Auto on the left-hand side, and you have London on the right-hand side. London stoplights. Yeah. Dr. Chu, thank you for that uh, very interesting and expansive uh, presentation. When you were doing the benchmarking with respect to lines of code, when I was an undergraduate, part of the strategy of writing code because you had to go into the computer science building in the middle of the night to get your cards punched was to be as efficient as possible because then you had fewer cards that had to actually be punched. So when you talk about 50 million lines of code, I don't want to overuse the term meaningful, but are they all meaningful lines of code? It's safe to assume that they're all essential components of the software. Yeah, the question is, is lines of code a meaningful metric for using um, uh, uh, complexity? The answer is uh, no, it's not. But on the other hand, you know, when we go out and we gra grab a novel, uh, we know that you can read Dostoevsky, which is 1,000 pages, or you can read a novella from Steinbeck, which is 100 pages. We all recognize it's a novel, but there may be a tenfold difference. Um, but by and large, when you start looking at large blocks of code, all I'm saying is it's a lot. Uh, whether you're talking about 30 or 40 million lines of code, there's no difference. I, I would consider anybody telling me 20 million versus 40 million lines of code, they're the same numbers. I, I think all we can say is it's not 5 million lines, it's not 1 million lines. And uh, to give you some metric, which is kind of interesting, OpenEMR, which is a public domain version of the Vista the VA system, is around two and a half million lines of code. And the reason why it's that low is they've stripped out everything that's custom. And so they, you basically have a core system that does very basic stuff. And that's not a bad model to work from, but it's, it turns out it's not very usable because in practice, you may not have to deal with all the variations in practice that you deal with in the real world. Um, I don't think I want to have a primary care workflow do transplants, but from a core EMR standpoint, there isn't a whole lot of difference between the two. So you also pointed out that uh, a lot of the market space for EHR or EMR is, 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 is occupied by Epic and that seems to be a growing fraction. Do you envision in the future that there's going to be competition slash an improved product to compete in that market? market? Uh, the question was whether there are uh, products other than Epic uh, going to dominate the marketplace. 
Um, software has been a very interesting business. All these companies go through one cycle, and that one cycle is uh, all the healthcare companies, uh, software companies have gone through one cycle. And typically there's a guru who's in charge of that company who has the vision and guides the structure of the product. And um, it's amazing how often companies are able to, not able to sustain a second round. Uh, or if they do do a second round, they don't do a third round. So I think the question is really unclear. Um, one of the reasons why the VA system has, uh, is no longer uh, being supported is that the chief architecture of that system is over 85 now, and a lot of the core designers of the system ha are, are no longer functional as, a, as, as an architects. Um, you mean the individuals are over 85 years old? Yes. Yeah, the individuals, the, the, these people started the project in 19, uh, 1977, I believe. And so the, they reached a point where the, the, the chief architects of the, the people who understood the system from a global standpoint and could manipulate the pieces and get them to work, uh, no, no longer are there. Um, Meditech ran into this problem. The chief architect of that system is Neil Papillardo and he got a stroke about five years ago. And so you can see that uh, Meditech has basically, you know, even though they're able to keep up with the demands, they have lost a lot of the marketplace because they haven't been able to muster the support. Um, Cerner and Epic, Cerner is less so, but Epic is definitely run as a single person that's the visionary for the product. So, you know, the answer is very, not very clear. I, I think, um, Companies do have trouble once they reach a certain size to have maintain a culture. Yeah. Um, how is this any different than banking? Right, banking has been using the same type of software for forty years now, and they've just transferred it onto the new hardware. But the the problem is not all that different, right? Banks can intercommunicate; they can send money from my account to from, to your account at different banks. So um, why hasn't that? I mean, why hasn't that architecture taken off with EMRs? Um, okay, the question is why uh, banking uh, has been able to sustain its architecture for uh, uh, 40 or 50 years and why they've been able to contain it uh, and, and why that it doesn't apply to EMRs. Well, I, I think one of the things is the level of complexity and the scalability. Um, there are a lot of banks out there. There's a lot of money out there that can be used to develop a bank software that has a very broad base. And there are a lot of strong financial incentives for, for getting that to, do, to work. The other thing is banking industry has largely uh, become entirely an electronic business. Um, if healthcare were to be that way, I would assume you could do that. But I think banking itself has run into some severe problems. And one of the things that I read recently was the, the delta between the American system and the European system. The American system requires you to, to uh, do a nightly reconciliation. The European systems are, are doing it in real time. So that delta alone says the American systems really need to change and haven't. So I, I would argue that your truth may be only half there. Tom? Um, just your uh, reference to the UK experience. Uh, I think there are a lot of things we can learn from them uh, beyond what you read about in the Wall Street Journal. And the first is their campaign in health IT is a lot longer than this most recent uh, NPF IT, which is the one that you read about. It's gone on for decades. Um, the second lesson is that it's highly political because they invested or appropriated 35 billion for a country that's a fifth our size. So that's $150 billion. That's very political when that happens. And even though our uh, expenditure has been lower than that, it will also likely become much more political than it is. And the third is, they have done a really good job with health information exchange, and it doesn't show up in the newspaper. But if you move from one city to another, your GP can, uh, half of the GPs can import your entire record up to the date you got your flu shot into their separate vendor system. So it can be done, and it was done with very strong incentives. Um, and the fourth lesson I would say is that before you can exchange this information electronically, it has to be electronic. So, so, so 
so they, they spend a lot of time bringing GPs up into uh, using EMRs. A painful process, we're going through it now, but that was sort of the foundation of their success with information exchange. Tom's summary was uh, that the Europeans, have been, the British have been working on this a long time, and they've done a lot, and we have a lot more to do, I think. Is that a good summary of what, what you said? And yes, I think we have just embarked on this. I mean, the British have obviously been doing it for 20 years. We've been doing it for five. And so I think that's why the 10-year plan, which is now a 15-year plan, uh, really is probably more realistic. Yeah, there's a question back. Yeah, um, you talked about clinical visit summaries being very difficult to implement because it just isn't in the workflow. And a lot of the pain that we've seen with the, some of the epic rollout in our clinics is it doesn't match the workflow. Do we need to be working with software manufacturers to make a better software product, or we need, do we need to change our workflow to meet what the actual EMR is that we have deployed? Andy's comment was, uh, the question was, there's a lot of differences between the workflow that's in the system and the workflow that people are doing, and what do we have to do to, to bridge that delta? Well, um, I believe part of the problem is the software, part of the problem is us. Uh, I was at the, the Epic Users Group meeting in September, and Duke University made a presentation about their transplant workflow, and it was clearly a workflow that we had not implemented here. Um, it was quite different. Um, it was quite complicated. <laughs> they had clearly spent a lot of time doing it. And um, I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done in our area to, to bridge that they gap. They tailored it for their EMR. No, they have Epic. But do, do they do a good job of interfacing with Epic, or are they still struggling like we are? They were much, it was very clear their workflow uh, the question was, is, what did they do? What did Duke do? They clearly had spent a lot of time tailoring the workflow, and it was very clear that the practitioners there uh, were much happier with their system than we were. They had actually met a lot of their needs, but it was not easy or quick. It, it was very clear that, that they had spent at least two years doing it. Thanks a lot.